Hello and welcome to another modern stream. Uh, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Uh, I have done uh, a video like this in the past, so that was a really long time ago. Uh, basically what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about uh, mulligans. Uh, mulligans, if you're familiar with Amulet, is probably one of the most uh, complicated complicated and perplexing things uh, for those uh, new to the to the deck. Um, the way that we approach uh, mulligan in with, um, with a list like this is much different than your average, uh, you know, like, magic concept right when we're, when you are playing magic usually you're mixed you're looking for a mix of uh, lands and spells right um so that you can you know kind of like that's like one of the most basic things that they teach you when you just learn how to play limited right you want you want like two or three lands maybe more depending on the format or whatever but you want a mixture of lands and spells that will you know kind of help you progress your game plan while stopping your opponents with amulet uh, things are uh, are much more different because the things that we're looking for are very very specific. Uh, usually, my my basic uh, concept when it comes to mulligan is I'm looking for three things and I'm looking for at least two of those three things and I'm, I actually put them in different tiers. Let me explain what what I'm talking about here. We're looking for lands. We're looking for uh, ramp. Okay, we're looking for a way uh, of getting to six mana. And finally, we're looking for a threat. Okay, so those are going to be the three things uh, that we're going to be that we're going to be looking for when you just look at our opening hand. Um, now, this uh, actually do th these are actually a little bit more flexible than the way that I'm describing them as uh, as right now. Uh, what do I mean by this, for example? Amulet is it's in a weird spot in in this in in this um, you know in this um, way to organize things because amulet is certainly ramp right uh, amulet is is a card that's going to help us ramp however it's not ramp if we don't have access to a bounce land and it's actually a even better ramp if we have access to a land and a bounce land, right? So, for example, if we have a, a hand with, you know, uh, Gemstone Mine, Simi Growth Chamber, Amulet, and Asusa, even though we only have two lands, okay, which is not that many, we actually have a path to get into six mana for Primeval Titan. So, as you can see, even though we're looking for, you know, lands, a ramp, and a, and a threat, a payoff, uh, now the lands category, it's actually... Whoops! I try to <laughs> I try to set up the, the lighting over here. It just it just it just died on me. Okay, I'm gonna put here over put it over here, so alright, cool. Good to know that that doesn't work. Um I'm gonna try something else then. Uh so yeah, so as you can see, like the the um the lands uh, category that we're talking about here actually gets um, gets affected, and it's not that it's 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 uh, less important, right? Like we still do need lands. It's just a matter of we need those in in less of an amount, if if that makes sense. Um, usually, um, you want some kind. I do know that I'm online, doesn't matter, what do you mean? <laughs> um, do, do, do you guys not hear me talking? It should be working right now, right? Yeah, okay. All right, like don't don't trick me like this. Yesterday I actually left the stream open without even noticing, so... Don't troll me with that kind of thing, because I'm I'm too susceptible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm too susceptible to those jokes right now. Um, all right, so <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, going back to this talk. Um, also, what we're trying to do here is we are we're going to be talking about um, this. In, in an abstract context, okay? So what I mean is uh, on the blind, 
okay? So uh, things do change in, 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 in a very significant matter in post cyber games, depending on what we are, what, on the information that we know and how our sideboard looks like. Uh, but we're, we're going to talk about this uh, later. For now, I want to try to focus on the abstract. Okay, let's say that you're just practicing. You're practicing, you know, your your goldfishes, right? And you're trying to like get a feel for for how the for how the, the deck mulligans, and you're trying to yeah practice to see see some example of opening hands and try to see how to how to navigate those opening hands. Uh, this is what we're going to talk about uh, in the beginning for now. And then we can we can go into more specifics, uh, but yeah. So like the the basic the basic guidelines then is going to be those three aspects. We want to make sure that we have every single one of these, and uh, you can very uh, confidently mold again down to uh, six and five, um, because if you get access to one of these uh, hands, then your then. Um, your win percentage will certainly go up, and you don't need like a full seven cards. As long as you have this, um, this, um, this three aspects covered. Uh, usually, my rule of thumb is when I'm on the play, if I if I'm I'm starting the game and I'm on the play, uh, my rule of thumb is I want to make sure that I have a hand that can yield me at least a turn four primeval type. Okay. When I'm on the draw, uh, of course, because of how fast the modern format is, um, I am going to look for a turn three primeval titan. Yeah, uh, gladly uh, the printing of Castle Garenbrick has made our turn three titans uh, way more consistent, which is of course a great a great thing for us because Castle actually um, expands. The the uh, the spread of uh, openers that we can keep, uh, particularly when we are on the draw. So uh, Castle obviously was was an incredible printing for us. And uh, the list that I'm playing right now, you see that I'm not doing any of the Balaka nonsense. Um, I'm I'm still gonna continue testing that list. I I still think that I have not found uh, a, a list that I'm particularly you know ecstatic about or that I'm not super happy with. So I am going to talk about the mulliganing based on this. Uh, nothing should change too much uh, for for the, the Valakid versions of the deck. The, the stuff that we're looking for is still going to be the exact same thing. Um, but, but yeah, so let's actually go ahead and let's uh, play some... <laughs> oh, they changed this, right? Crap. How do we... How do I do solitaire now? Can I even do solitaire anymore? Is anybody in chat? Does anybody in chat knows know how to do it solitaire now? It's in modern. Modern open play? No, that ha that can't be it, right? Is it? Hmm. Huh, I guess I should have figured this out before firing up the stream. <laughs> uh create number oh there you go, number of players one. Okay, so we're gonna do just me, create. Oh, this is so much more confusing. <laughs> All right, I I one shot carries. Thank you for the follow. All right, so here we are, and we see this as an opener. As an opener. Uh, one thing that I also wanted to to talk about. Um, no, no, we 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 got it. We got it. We 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 figure it out. So we're in solitaire mode. We're only gonna be. I'm actually gonna be. You know, bring it. Put bringing the hand a little bit bigger, just so so everybody can see more clearly. Uh, we are uh, met with this opening hand. And we look at the factors that we're looking for, right? So we have we have lands, we have that part covered in spades, uh, but then we are missing a threat, and we're missing ramp. Okay, so this is game one in the dark. Let's assume that we are on the play. 
I think we can actually do that. We can analyze both hands on the play or on the draw as we see them. So uh, we're greet, we were greet, greet, greeted. Well, we, we see this this opener, and we go through through our categories. We cover the lands one, and we're missing uh, actually quite uh, quite heavily on both of the other ones, right? We don't have a threat, and we don't have a ramp creature or spell. Even even I mean, an amulet sometimes counts, depend on the depending on the shape of the hand. Uh, this uh, is a once upon a time. It can likely find either one or the other either ramp or threat. Uh, something that's um, important to know too is that uh, the likelihood of finding a threat is actually half as the likelihood of finding a ramp spell. So once upon a time is more reliably going to be a ramp uh, spell than, uh, than a threat, a primeval titan, because it can only find four titans plus two T-Wests, while it can find uh, four Azusas and four scouts. Correct. So when you look at a hand like this, uh, I guess under most circumstances, if, if 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 there was a titan here, for example, then once upon a time could be would be closer to be considered a ramp spell than uh, if if we had a ramp creature and we can and we could consider this a threat. Still, since we're looking for two out of three, okay, here we actually have only one. And this is a possible way of finding one or the other one, but not both. Uh, another thing to consider is your one-offs, okay? In the blind, personally, uh, when I don't know what I'm getting paired against, I like to, um, I like to consider um, the, the, the one-offs. That would be a Pact of Negation, Reclamation Sage, if you're playing it, Engineered Explosives. I basically like to consider those... Uh, a mulligan, okay, so I, I don't really count them. Yes, there are uh, matchups where Pact of Negation, have, uh, having it in game one is going to be huge. That would be Scape Shift, Tron, uh, Control Decks. In those kind of matchups, uh, Pact of Negation is going to be very, very good, right? Uh, but still, nevertheless, I try to make sure that I... Um, I, I usually just, in the blind, when I have no information about what my opponent is playing, I uh, like to consider this as... A pseudo mulligan. So this hand is very clearly and very obviously a mulligan, whether you're on the play or on the draw. This is just not a, a keepable hand. So uh, we can go down to six very, very confidently. And you see why we can go down to six very confidently, right? Look at this hand right here. This hand, even if we were on a mul to five, this hand would be incredible, right? Even if we, if we were on a mul to five, uh, this hand would just be the nuts. Hey man, do you have a solid list uh, at all? I'm not interested in the drive Valkyrie idea. Uh, hey Vardorov, how's it going? Thank you for the tier 1 sub. Welcome back to the Primetime Stronghold, first of all. And second of all, uh, the list that I am showing you right now would be what I would register for a tournament if if I had one this weekend. Um, which looks like this. In fact, I should probably update the... Um, the stream decker so you can have access to it. Castle amulet. Alright, I'm going to update the stream decker so you can so you can check it out. Amulet castle amulets. Alright, stream decker is good to go. So you can check it out over there. Okay, going back to our to our sideboard discussion. Uh, this hand is just uh, magnificent, right? We have literally everything that we want. We even have an amulet, so um, our semi-growth chamber actually basically pulls off double duty, right? Um, but yeah, so let's say that we didn't have an amulet in this hand, okay? Let's say that this were a second scout. We would still keep this hand. Of course, we would bottom the second scout because we actually have a payoff and we do have multiple, way, multiple ways of ramping. At this point, basically any bounce land or any castle, Vesuva also counts because we already have access to, to a semi chamber. So um, any of those cards or even an amulet 
would make would give us a primeval titan mana and we can play the titan as early as turn four which again if we are on the on the play this is perfectly acceptable and it's actually in fact uh, quite quite good for us so um that would be that would be the idea and yeah again we're covering two of the boxes we have a threat and we have ramp and then we're only missing lands. And usually, based of our on based on our deck construction, uh, lands is the most likely for you to find. That's also another important thing. Uh, the fact that um, also, by the way, I said that castle was uh, gave us item mana. That's actually not true. Uh, that's that's my mistake. I was I, I wasn't looking at this. Actually, it doesn't up from green. So. Um, so castle actually doesn't doesn't count, but we have uh, two draw steps, three draw steps. We have three draw steps to find any bounce land or any two lands. We can we can also find any two kind of lands and everything like anything like that, um, and we we'll still would be fine because we actually do have an amulet. Of course, this is not even true, right? Uh, we we actually have more than we need here. In fact, this is what this could very easily be considered the nuts. Right, not not the, not the nuttiest nuts, but definitely an eight out of ten uh, kind of hand. Um, yes, so I'm considering uh, usually when when I'm keeping hands again, I'm in the blind. I am looking at the hands in the abstract. Okay, so I'm considering if my opponent doesn't have any way of interacting with me, what happens? How would I play this hand? How would I sequence everything? How would I make it work? Uh, because uh, that's not the way that magic works. <laughs> that's just, you know, of course, the only, the only something that works when you are on game one, right? So even though I'm, I, I see this hand as my opener, it's very possible that my opponent goes turn one Thoughtseize and I don't have a Titan anymore and now this hand is going to be significantly worse. However, this hand has a plan. Whenever you are you are you're mulliganing with amulet, what you want is you want to figure out what your plan is. This hand does have a plan. Our plan can get disrupted. Yes, it can. That's perfectly fine. Uh, we do have more threats in our deck, right? So it's not like after they thought this is this primeval titan, we have no way of winning anymore. Uh, but it's important for you to have a very clear path uh, towards uh, winning the game. And this hand very, very obviously has it. Um, now, on a, on, a different, on a slightly different note, when I'm looking at this hand, uh, actually the thing that I would send to the bottom would be the Sakura Tribe Scout. And the reason for this is that let's consider that my opponent is playing a discard spell deck, okay? If they are playing a discard spell deck, then out of all the cards that I would like my that my opponent will have the chance to take, this is the more uh, the less worthy. And I'm actually very very interested in making sure that this amulet resolves. So even if this were a seven card hand, I would still lead on amulet on on turn one because amulet is the more the more unique card in this hand. Also, there's the fact that Amulet leads, leads me to turn to turn to Asusa, right? Uh, but that's kind of the point. So if I go turn one Amulet, my opponent goes turn one Inquisition, and they're left uh, with the um, you know with the option of taking either my Asusa or my or my Scout. Uh, that's fine. You know they're probably gonna take the Asusa, obviously, unless they they don't understand like, how how my deck works. But uh, we're still left with a Scout, and we can still progress our game plan just like just normally hitting land drops, working towards a turn four or maybe even turn. Um, turn 5 titan usually against discard spells unless it's specifically shadowed a turn 4 or 5 titan is going to be more than enough uh, more often than not but uh, yeah so as you can see like amulet is the more unique card here if i went turn 1 scout and my opponent goes turn 1 inquisition they take my amulet and now i actually don't have access to a turn 2 mana for a turn 3 titan unless i draw some lands right while amulet actually gives me whether my opponent takes this or this both of these cards actually lead me to a turn three primeval titan thanks to the amulet. So amulet is very clearly the more important and more unique card here. More than one year playing and still learn, I would blank Sekru, but you makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. So uh, these are the things that you know you want to start to try to. Um, how can I say it? Uh, try to like next next level, I guess, or try to be thinking ahead. Uh, but yeah, so as I was saying, look at this opener, 
Bolamin Scout. Yep. Um, but yeah, this is very clearly a keep on the play, obviously, and still a keep on the draw because, again, this hand leads me to a turn 3 Primeval Titan, which is something that I'm very excited about. On the draw... If I were on the draw... Yeah, I think if I were on the draw, I would still bottom the Sacred Tribe Scout. Yeah, because even if my opponent goes turn 1 Inquisition, they take my amulet, whatever. Um, I, I'm still working towards an Asusa, and I have now four, four draw steps uh, in order to find enough lands to, ca to cast a prime time on turn 4. So even through disruption, I think I would still bottom the Scout um, in the blind on turn, on turn 1. Yep. All right, let's assume that this was an unkeepable hand and we're going down to five, okay? So let, let's mulligan again, again and let's see what's up. Now we are met with this hand. Now, let's consider we are on the play, okay? This hand is most certainly a keep as well on a mull to five, yeah? We do have a threat. We do have a ramp spell. And we are very, very lucky, and we actually have a, an amulet. Yeah? So again, amulet makes mulls to five. Uh, th that's one thing that amulet does, uh, specifically the card amulet bigger, I mean, is it makes your mulligans uh, much, much better. And we see the exact example here, right? If this were a mull to five and we didn't have amulet, uh, we have lens, we have ramp, and we have a threat, but we're missing on lands. We would still keep on a mull to five, but thanks to Amulet, actually, we can bottom the Bojuke Bog and, and probably... Huh, this is actually tricky. Uh, we can go for the... We can go for the conservative play, which would be to keep the Field of the Dead. Um, but... If we keep the Field of the Dead, then we actually won't be able to cast Asusa on turn 2, which is kind of a big deal. So I, it might actually be correct for us to bottom both of these and hope to find an untapped land off of the Once Upon a Time, because uh, this is basically like whatever the opposite of a time walk is, right? If we do find a, 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 an untapped land here, uh, we actually have a turn three, a, a turn a three Titan with the hand that we that we're looking at. Even just with this, with this five cards, we are still looking at a turn three Titan on the play, which is pretty impressive, honestly. Uh, yeah, so that, that's that's what I was talking about, uh, George. It's actually pretty close. If you wanted, if you're not a gambler, <laughs> um, if you're not a gambler, you can go for the conservative route. Uh, on the blind, I think I would keep Field of the Dead over... No, actually, actually, I think I would keep Bojuki Bog over Field of the Dead. Because Field of the Dead is it's not going to be good until I resolve from Evil Titan. And um, yes, there are some matchups where Bojuki Bog is just not going to do anything, right? Uh, but if I actually get paired against Dredge or something like that, Bojuki Bog, having access to the Natty Bog, might be might be better. If we're playing against Burn, like both of these cards don't do anything. If we're playing like any kind of aggro deck, if we're playing against a control deck, both of these cards have value. This one has more value than this, but still, like both of these cards have value. Uh, but if we're but we are still going to have enough time to get to a point where we resolve our Titan and we actually get our field online, right? Uh, so field is very unlikely to be online unless I resolve my Primeval Titan. So I think that on the blind. Even though it might be more uh, tempting to to uh, to hold on to this field of the dead instead of the Bojuki Bog, I think that Bojuki Bog is going to be relevant in matchups that might end quickly, right? Uh, we might uh, we might find um, like Dredge or Crabbine or something like that might actually kill us before we get to get this going. So I think it's probably correct to keep Bojuki Bog. Uh, over field, that is. But overall, I think that the upside uh, with Once Upon a Time, it's so, so much higher 
that um, I think that it, it's probably correct to just uh, just bottom both of this and just hope that we find an untapped here. Um, that would be like the high high risk, high reward play uh, as opposed to the you know low risk but low reward. Right, we're talking about a turn three prime time with uh, with amulet versus at, at best a turn four prime time with amulet with this with this uh, five. So definitely, um, there you go, streamer. There you go, uh, Massacre Reaper. So that's 75.3442, okay. We have 75% to hit on a tap land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what, the thing is that those are the odds of hitting an, an untapped land, which are pretty high. Uh, but then the, there, there are a bunch of... There's a fail rate, which is not really failure, right? If we find a castle, if we find... Um, if we find any ETV tapped land... So basically, the only lands that we cannot find are this. Right? Because if we find any of the other ones... If we find any of the other ones, then we're actually ahead, right? Or we're actually either ahead or in the same spot. Like if we find a Tolario West or another one of the fields or any of the castles, we are in the same spot, but with potential upside. So yeah, so I think it might just be correct to to just keep the one some of the time and just hope that it hits. Dar said, "You can always find, uh, you can always find the deck list when exclamation point deck." Yeah, there, there, there you go, Dar said. Hope that you, hope that you are, you are enjoying the deck. Actually, I haven't updated Carbo Live because yesterday Carbo Live the bot was down. So let me update that real quick. Uh, <laughs> There. All right. So now both things are updated, both Cargo Live and the Stream Decker. For us, it's a two dryad to explore and one Valakun on twenty nine lands. Uh, that seems. Eh. I don't like it. I don't like that split. Personally. Uh, okay. So how do I restart this? Can I restart? No, okay, so I basically need to close and open up again. Okay, but th this this is not too painful. Uh, oh yeah, all the settings are saved. Sweet, good for us. All right, let's give it another shot. Again, we're met with this opener. What do we think, what do we think chat? Yes, Dar said this is the list that I will bring to uh, to an event. <laughs> yeah, so this is a mulligan, both on the play and on the draw. I already uh, I already talked about how I how I analyze Pact of Negation, particularly when we don't have access to double blue mana, right? Uh, I do take I do consider Pact of Negation to be basically uh, a, already a mulligan. <laughs> And this hand has a turn five Titan at best. We're, uh, we're basically just like hitting land drops. So we do have lands and we do have a threat, but we don't have ramp. And this is this comes back to what I was what I was talking about earlier, in that we're looking for three different things, right? We're looking for three different things, but uh, they have like different levels of importance. What do I mean by this? We do have even, we actually do have more lands than we need right here, okay? And we actually have a threat, but we don't have ramp. What this means is that even, even though I'm checking two of those three boxes, the ramp, the ramp, uh, the ramp category is way, way higher in importance than the threat category. And depending on what your land situation is, it, it's also ahead 
in than the land category as well. So actually the ramp category is probably the single most important one of them all. Usually the 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 um, the category that I value that I value the least is the threat category. Right? So if I have a if I have this hand but we have Azusa amulet, I actually would consider this hand a keep. Because we actually have lands we have a ramp and we have a, a way to make our our cards better. So we're only missing we're only missing um we're only missing um what's his name? A, a threat. And we have we are drawing towards ten threats. The four primeval titans, the four um the four uh summoners backed and the two tolerary wests. And even uh Field of the Dead could be considered uh, a threat with a hand like this, right? Because it would be pretty easy for us to get field going just with like field plus any other land. So we can even bring that threat count up to 12. Once upon a time also would help us either, either find a Titan or a Tolerate West as well. Yeah, so with, if I had Azusa plus Amulet in this hand, I would actually keep this hand. Not catchy. Do you still like Tekken Chinese? Yeah, now more than ever. Like, have you have you played have you played Moto? Like, Amulet is everywhere. It's crazy. <clears throat> Moldes. Yeah, that's correct. You just keep it home to top of the yeah, exactly. My rule is that I either see a ramp and consider my hand or instant Moldes. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, Ramp is actually quite important. The only exception would be if you have, for example, if you have, if you are on the play and you have amulet in here, right? So you don't have ramp, but you have amulet in here, and now that hand is actually a turn four, a turn four titan on the play with amulet, right? Because we go turn one, forest, amulet, turn two, breeding pool, turn three, castle, turn four, semi growth chamber, activate castle, and then we are attacking uh, with a hasty prime tab on turn four, which is which is what something that I would keep. Amulet is kind of ramping away. Yeah, exactly. What's the best bounce land artwork? Uh, honestly, I have an affinity for semi Growth Chamber, but that's probably mo mostly because it's the bounce that I've seen the most. Uh, but personally, I have uh, Gruel Turf is my, my favorite in terms of the art. Do you mulligan until you have a turn 3 Titan? If I'm on the play, I I am okay with a turn 4 Titan, uh, particularly if it if it has uh, Amulet. That's, that's why I was saying if this were instead uh, an Amulet. Um, so you can actually keep a turn four Titan with, if you're on the play. How do you beat Neoform? You just don't beat Neoform, <laughs> I guess. You just don't beat Neoform, so like, yeah. <laughs> By hoping they ban it. Yep. I'm just try going to continue being very vocal about how much I, I hate that deck. And then hopefully we're going to get there at some point. Uh, all right. So we talked about this hand. Let's try the mulligan. What do we see here, chat? My tiny opponent beats me with Cyborg Cage. Feels bad. I mean, they should. You should feel bad. But you should feel bad because of registering the deck in the first place, not because of losing. I see Blood Moon Wall. <laughs> yeah, so here we have, first of all, I talked about Engineer Explosives in the blind. We don't like this, right? Engineer Explosives in the blind, that's already a mulligan. Second of all, we do have a threat. Oh yeah, one thing, one thing that I haven't talked about. You almost never can consider Summoner's Pact as ramp. I know that Pact can get you Azusa. I'm, I'm very well aware of this. But the only situations in which you can consider Summoner's Pact ramp is if you already have um an amulet and if you already have a threat in hand 
Okay, so those are the those are the only ways that you can consider this. For example, let's let's say that this was a seven. Okay, let's say that this was a seven. This is not a simple chamber, but this is an, a basic forest. Okay, so we have a basic forest here, and then we have summoner's pact, summoner's pact, amulet. Yep. In that case. We can go turn one basic forest, play amulet. Turn two, we can pack for Azusa, play bounce land. Cast Azusa, bouncing the forest, replay forest, and I guess you can either play the Vesuva or you can play the other semi growth chamber. I think that play, playing the Vesuva would actually be better. It leaves you with more lands in play. And then on turn three, you can pack again for a Titan, after you pay for Pact and Upkeep, and thanks to the Azusa Plus Amulet, with the Bounce Land in hand, you actually will be able to cast a Titan on turn 3. So, if we have a situation like that, that is the only context in which you can consider Summoner's Pact ramp. Yep. When it actually ramps. Because if there's no Amulet involved, or if there's an Amulet but you don't have a Bounce Land or something like that, uh, then... Um, Pacting for Azusa, it's not really um, accelerating your Titan turn. Yeah? So basically, the rule is you can only consider Pact Ramp if you have an amulet and, you know, a bounce land that you can hold in hand and enough lands to, like, pay for your Pact, basically. Yeah? The other alternative, of course, would be, you know, if it's turn three and you have, like, you know, land... Um, if you have castle in play and another land and amulet plus bounce land, right? This this is actually a new scenario that is only possible because of uh, because of castle. So if you have a castle in play and any other untapped land, whatever, and you have an amulet in play, you can use Simic Growth Chamber and use the the forest. Let's say it's a forest. So use gro gro ch um, Growth Chamber plus forest. And you ca you pack for Azusa, you cast your Azusa, and then you play Simigo Chamber both times. Activate Castle, cast the Titan. Yeah. So basically, by itself, Pact can never be considered uh, ramp. I hope that I hope that that concept made sense, and I was able to you know explain explain it in a reasonable way. <clears throat> So you don't think Durset? There we go. I sorry, I missed your question earlier. There you have the answer. Hey, what's your point in the Twitter screenshot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen you. I've seen you, Riley. I've seen you play play Amulet multiple times. So yeah, I, I knew I knew who you were. It felt it felt bad. It felt bad. I'm not gonna I'm gonna gonna lie. Especially because my hand was kind of nuts, both games two and three. So. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, again, a mulligan. Brutal match, yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, we're doing great, Aaron. We're uh, tr talking some mulligan in with amulets. What do we think here, chat? Consider this symbol to five, okay? It is a mul to five. Why did I go down to one counter spell in the sideboard? Um, it's either one or two. Uh, usually, usually the sideboard is very, very uh, flexible, right? You should never consider that like the sideboard that I'm putting out there. It's the the truth, right? So um, I am just you know testing things out all the time, and I am I'm I'm trying to stay flexible and try to see where the metagame goes and stuff. And right now, like Negate, I would only want against against Tron, which we already have a reasonable matchup against, and something like Ad Nauseam or some kind of like spell-based combo deck, Storm or whatever. Super Keep, Sneep. Have I like Deckage? Yeah, I think Deckage is actually very, very good. Maybe Mollifid was a 7. Sun Home and Exploits would have returned as well. Can't see anything but a perfect 4 being better. Yeah, exactly. So this I would actually keep. This I would actually keep. And I think what I would do 
spawn on these two. At this point, I am missing many things, right? I, I do have enough lands. I do have enough lands. But again, it's a, it's a numbers game. I have 30 lands in my deck. So one of these explorers or um, one of these explorers or um, just my draw steps, something is going to yield me another land. And worst case scenario, I, if I don't find another land, I can always transmute. I guess that I would need that to do that, so never mind. Uh, but we have a castle, which is almost ramp, and we have explore, which is going to uh, hopefully yield us a titan. And that's why I would personally like to keep hold on to the explore as opposed to the basic forest. Even though the basic forest uh, helps castle come into play uh, untapped. Um, actually, I I'm, I'm thinking about it a little bit harder now, and I think that we actually want to bottom this. So we keep Forest, Castle, Simic, Explores. This allows me to go turn one Castle, turn two Forest. We already have double green, so any, any color of the land is going to yield us a turn four Titan. Uh, remember that we're going to move to five, right? So we're not, we're not looking too hot anyway already. Uh, but this, this hand has a plan, right? And I want to try to maximize the chances of me finding a threat. Uh, note that in order for Talaria West to turn into a threat, we would need to find exactly a bounce land, and we are less likely to find a bounce land than we are to find an actual threat, right? Because we only have access to seven bounce lands, eight counting Vesuva, while we have access to uh, eleven threats, uh, to nine threats, sorry, plus the ones upon a times. Yeah, I, I know that Tolaria is is nice if we don't if we define the second bounce land, but I think that I it, it's more likely for me to find I mean I just explained it's more likely for me to find the actual threat and it's much better for me to find the actual threat thanks to the explorers and try to dig a little bit deeper than it is for me to find one of the bounce lands. It's just a numbers game. It's also nice if you top deck mine or breeding pool. That is true. That is very, very true. But it also means that I'm not going to be able to do it on turn 4, right? Because I'm going to be casting Explorer on turn 2, casting Explorer on turn 3, and then the first time I actually have enough mana, I don't have an amulet, right? So the first time I actually have enough mana, even if I draw a bounce land, to transmute is going to be on turn 4, which means that my Titan is not going to be is not going to be coming down until turn 5. This keeping explore has way higher upside because if I don't need to transmute for the Titan, then I'm actually I can actually play it on turn four. So yeah, uh, that is that is the explanation. Does that make sense? Any questions in chat? Any other? Any other counterpoints to what I to what I just said and why I think that this is the five that I would keep? I don't really see the value of the second explorer. See, the first one gives us turn four Titan mana by itself. That is true, but having access to explore to another explorer digs me deeper towards a turn four Titan, right? Like if we just like we are not doing anything better than fourth that turn four Titan. Right? That means that Explore is an extra cantrip that finds me either lands or I, it finds me um, an actual Titan. So I'd rather dig deeper. Yeah, exactly. I am valuing the redraw in order to try to find the Titan higher than I am valuing either of these lands, if that, can, if that makes sense. Because of how my curve is going to look like. Let's goldfish this five real quick. Okay, so we're gonna keep bottom this, bottom this, done. Well, I I guess that we were on the draw <laughs> because Moto just drew a card for us, which I didn't want to. Um, but anyway, let's say that we're on the draw, I guess. So we start on basic forest. Turn two, explore. Huh. Uh, yeah, we can actually bring pool here safely. Uh, we also save two mana because next turn we're going to be able to explore plus once upon, which is nice. 
Got him got pretty unlucky here, but that's fine, that's fine. Alright. <laughs> cool, so we're gonna do this, and on my opponent's turn we cast once upon a time. And there it is. Turn 4 Titan. But yeah, you see that, you know, having access to the extra explore. If I had kept the um if I had kept the the Toleria West, I would be using my turn four right now to float my mana and bounce my T West in order to transmute, right? But instead what we're doing is we're you know actually casting a Titan. So now since I'm already down to five and I'm already um and we're already behind. Yeah, Pikes, but I was I was considering that we were on the play. <laughs> when I made my mulligan decision and like my reasoning, then I, I was considering that we were on the play. Because if we're on the draw, we're already getting access to one more draw step. So obviously the explorer loses a ton of value. First of all, because it takes time. And also because we're already digging as far as we would be already, right? Because, yeah, so when I made the explanation, keeping the explore made more sense. It's possible that on the drop, it is actually the other way around. And that's that's a very interesting uh, concept right there, actually, um, which, uh, which we can talk about, you know, like your mulligan decisions, because of how your curve looks like, um, should be slightly different when you are on the play and when you are on the draw. And they should be very, very different if you are considering uh, specific matchups, right? So lessons take away is to always consider how deep you're digging for a threat and how you best utilize the, that between once explorers and if you have the extra draw. Yeah, exactly. So as you can see, um, as you can see, um, there's a lot of a lot of things to consider, and there's a lot of planning ahead to be doing, right? So you see that I look at my opening seven, and I am thinking of how my turn three and four are going to be looking like. Yeah? So that's the first thing that I do when I see an opening hand, and that is the kind of thing that uh, kind of takes takes a minute before... Darcy, thank you for the follow. Uh, it it kind of takes a minute before you actually start kind of like... Automa uh, automatizing this, like making this thought process automatic, you know, you look at your opener and you're thinking, okay, this is turn one, this is turn two, this is turn three, this is turn four. And I am trying to like do all the math and try to think of all those, of all of those sequences in my head very quickly when I just see my opening hand. Automating, yeah, there you go. The redraw loses value on the draw. Yeah, so uh, precisely, because you are you're already you're already digging one card deeper just by default because you're not skipping your draw step. How does Mulligan change after Cybering or against Thoughtseize deck? Um, that is a great question. Um, let's do a couple of more like Cyborging examples on the in the blind, and then I'm gonna move on to uh, to post Cyborging decisions. Okay. So create one player, cool. All right, still on the play. What do we see here? What do we like? Feel like I keep too many hands after sideboard when I see a sideboard card. Uh, that could be correct or it could be incorrect. We're gonna talk about later. Keep. What else? What else do we see? I like this hand. This hand is an amazing. Don't be shy, chat. We can hand an accelerant 66% of the time. Some pretty good odds. Keep hope for a ramp creature of once at a time. Keep, keep. Yeah. I agree. Right? We have three. Three categories, lands, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Let's do a copy of Celestial Sanctuary. We have Titan mana. Whee, great. 
Explore. Explore is a very weird card in that it I don't really consider it ramp, but it still smooths out our draws and it digs us towards uh, cards like Castle, which are pseudo ramp, and it also uh, helps us by um, enabling new new play patterns. Okay, um, so for example. We actually have a somewhat reasonable path towards a turn for a Titan right here, correct? Why? Because thanks to Explore, once upon a time can find four Scouts, four Azusas, four Castles, right? Explore is actually making Castle a path for us towards turn four Titan on the play. Does that make sense? We, we once upon, find castle, turn one, turn two, we play sanctuary on turn two. Turn three, we play another land, turn four, we play castle, we cast our titan. While at the same time, obviously, it's digging us towards amulet, towards a natural titan instead of having to pack for it, towards a scout, a Susa, etc. So, explore actually is doing way more work thanks to the card castle than it it, it normally it, it just uh, obviously meets the eye, if that makes sense. Yeah. So actually, explore just by being here in my hand allows me to it just allows me more good hits off of once upon a time so i'm not only hitting um i'm not only hitting uh, four uh, eight cards towards a turn for titan i'm actually hit, trying to hit 12. of course the same is true because of the extra redraw of explorer right so um you know it's 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 still weird to me how people you know kind of dislike uh, dislike explore because uh, I think that with the printing of castle and our deck trying to you know maximize precisely the value that we get from castle uh, explore actually has become significantly better than it was before I remember when we used to play serum visions when people said that the draw in our decks is kind of one turn value um, well, the, the reason that we were playing Serum Visions before, it's because, uh, which is actually pretty true, which is the fact that Scrying for us actually is, is quite close to a draw. Because um, we're looking for specific cards, and the, car, the specific cards that we're, that we're looking for will basically outvalue all the card advantage uh, that, you can, that you can get with, uh, with a draw, right? So... That's why that's why we used to play Serum Visions, which I which I thought was it, it still remains true. However, again, I just explained how and why um, Explore it's actually uh, very very good in in a situation like this with a with a keep like this one. Yep, does that make sense? So bottom line, this is a great keep. I mean, it's not like great. It's it's just it's it's a solid keep. You're gonna. You're gonna play a league today? Yes, I am. But yeah, but somebody donated for me to to do like this this overview uh, of mulligans. All right, let's try another one. Let's say that oh, this hand was terrible. We somehow mulliganed it. Misclicked. What do you got here? Remember, we're on the play, okay? Remember, we're on the play. Is some of the vigor still run? I haven't seen it in forever. You should play more modern kill guy. Amulet is right now one of the most popular decks in Magic Online. Was this donation? It was actually good. Yeah, yeah. I, I I always you know enjoy when people donate for me to to this kind of thing because it kind of like changes uh, the 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 it changes the the idea of the stream, which is cool. Mool if it's a seven, keep on six. Mool. What else? What else do we got? Mole. I would mole. 
knowing this versus not knowing this is being able to play this versus no it's a good deck and just watch others win with it but yeah more than that. <laughs> yeah on the blind whether there was a six or a seven i think i would actually ship it if this were a green source obviously this is a this is a great hand as it stands right now we don't even have titan mana we're one short of titan mana and we have at least two basically irrelevant cards. Yes, your opponent bolts your scout on turn one. Yeah, the, the second scout might be relevant. Okay. But you're also not playing the scout until turn three. And even if you are, unless you draw an amulet, you're not playing the titan until turn five. If you draw a land. So I would ship this. I think that we can do much better on five. Whether on the play or whether I'm on the draw, I would ship this. Unless I know I was specifically playing against Burn. And even if I knew that, it would still be a sketcher. Because I can gain like four life maybe. But yeah, at the cost of... <laughs> yeah, at a very high cost. If, if this were Azusa, whole thing changes. Okay? If this were an Azusa, the whole thing changes. Because that's turn 3 Azusa into a very high potential of a turn 4 Titan. Right? While gaining five, uh, while gaining 4 life. Yeah? The fact that this is Scout is what messes this one up. But if this were Azusa, if this were Azusa you just bottom your Scout and you keep actually... I don't want to say very happily, but you happily keep. Um... And again, in, this, in a hand like this, this pack does not count as an Azusa. Because Azusa, it's not going to help you. Even with Azusa, I don't like this much if this is in already. I disagree. I, I think that if this were a 7 and this were an Azusa instead of a Scout, I think I would keep it in the blind. What if you had turn 1 green source? So forest instead of fountain. Oh, if, if that's the case, then this is a snap keep. If this were a basic forest, then this is a snap keep. You can go turn one scout. Assuming this is a six, uh, I think I would bottom the redundant scout. Uh, but assuming this is a six, you turn one scout. You turn two uh, gruel turf plus forest. You turn three simic growth chamber plus forest, and you turn four by by turn four. You know you can cast your titan. Assuming this this scout doesn't die. Um, Actually, in the blind, it's probably better for us to bottom the summoner's back as opposed to the second scout. Since there are probably more removal spell decks than discard spell decks in the format. Yeah, so I think I would actually I think I would actually just um, bottom the summoner's back instead of the tribe scout. As is. Looking at the hand as is, again, we're on the play. I would mulligan this. So let's go down, both on the play and on the draw, by the way. Let's go to five. This is when things start getting tricky. What about here? If one scout is once a time, snappy game will say, yeah, good, good point. Because that can find you both uh, a, 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 an untapped green for one and stuff. How about this five? We're moving it into five and we meet this opener. Hey, Wecht, how's it going? Keep, once finds a playable land, then we have draw steps towards Asusa Titan. Good. Hey, Scott, how's it going? Happy Thursday. Keep on the drop. 94%. George, how are you so good at finding the percentages so quickly? This is crazy. Do you have like a calculator right next to you or something? Mole too big, too big risk. Yeah, so my my thoughts. I would keep this hand and I would cheat packed and explore. We're already down to five. 
Okay, we're already down to five, but this hand has a plan. Yes, this hand also has a fail rate, okay? This hand does have a fail rate, don't get me wrong. If we whiff on once upon a time, we, we are screwed. However, mathematically, the numbers look good for us, okay? So it is it is a matter of percentages. Yeah, we see we see that uh, George just did the math right there. What ninety six point five percent of of hitting hitting uh, what we're looking for. We're already down to five. Okay, so you have to also remember the fact that we're moving it down to five. If this were a seven, I would ship it, right? In fact, if if this were a seven, would I ship it? Huh. Yeah, I think if this were a seven, I think I would ship it. Yeah. Um. Okay, so it's 91.7. Yeah, like it's it's only 92. 92 sounds very, very good to me, honestly. And this is actually a situation that happens very often, honestly. And this is like precisely the strength of Once Upon a Time. And it's just like we're above 90% to hit, to hit what we're looking for. And the difference with a hand like this versus something, you know, a little bit less powerful is the fact, and why I was saying if this were a seven, maybe I would keep it, is that we're already down to five. If we're already down to five, we are, we actually have a very, very good plan with this hand, okay? That is the difference. We actually have, we have a very, pot a very, very real potential of a turn four Titan on the play, right? So we actually have a very powerful five card hand. If we go down to four, we're basically looking for specifically an amulet plus a uh, plus Asusa plus bounce land stock uh, kind of hand. And even if we do find that, then we we still need help off the top, right? Because we would need amulet plus untap land plus Asusa plus bounce land. That's four cards, and we're still gonna be missing either a prime time or like one of those pieces, right? So the chances of, our, of us hitting that in, in a four card hand are actually much lower than us hitting an untapped source off of this once upon a time. It doesn't even need to be an untapped source, right? It's not like we're doing anything on turn one anyway. But I think that this is actually a keep. Yes, we can whiff the once upon a time. In fact, I famously made a post on Twitter about how I actually whiffed. I, I found myself in a situation like this two days in a row, and I whiffed both times, which was hilarious. Um, but yeah, like the, the percentages are like again, we're like above ninety percent, and and you have to and you have to do this. So. I would bottom both of these cards because, again, the plan is to Asusa on turn 3 and then Titan on turn 4 and then go from there. So let's see it. Let's see it. Let's see it. Bingo. Phew. All right. Very good. <laughs> Boom. Yes. We won this solitaire game. <laughs> They are even better, actually, because the deck is 53 cards, so we only look at the top 51. Yeah, that's actually true, Sharking. That's that's a very good point. But yeah, that's, that's the idea. So, we have talked about mulligans in the abstract, okay? We have talked about looking at a couple of opening hands and trying to analyze, going really deep in trying to analyze... Uh, what it is we're doing, right? Like, what what is the plan? How are we how are we going to win uh, those those specific games? Now let's talk about sideboarding and how that affects the whole situation. Okay, so when we're talking about sideboarding, things get a lot more specific. Okay, sideboarding is sideboarding gets a lot more specific. What do I mean by this? There are certain matchups where we are very, very likely to just need the specific interaction in order to win.
okay? So, Hydra Bruce, thank you for the follow. Example of this is Devoted Druid, okay? The chances of you winning a game against Devoted Druid combo, uh, maybe like something with Heliel or some, some of those combo decks. You, you, know, you know the ones that I'm talking about. The chances of you winning one of those games... Uh, whether you're on the play or on the draw, it, it changes slightly, but bear with me. Um, the chances of you winning one of those matchups without any kind of interaction are extremely, extremely low and are basically specifically tied to two things. How close to your nut draw you are. Basically, if you can if you can kill your opponent before they are able to combo off, obviously, you know, you're going to win that game. <laughs> but that will probably require a, a double amulet Asusa primetime draw, which is, which is pretty unlikely. Um, or because your opponent hits their fail rate, which when we're talking about the deck like that one is actually very, very low. Uh, the the the, uh, the devoted druid combo deck is good because it it is actually so consistent. Wheel of fifty three that's stacking out the explorer and packed bottom card. The deck is sixty five. Oh yeah, uh, duh, you're actually correct. <laughs> you're actually correct. Yeah, yeah, that's that's totally true. Link your stream to the shadow discord. Good stuff for thoughtless players as well as some other guys. Oh yeah, so, yeah thank you three deuce. Um, so. So yeah, so when we're talking about um, Devoted Druid, we're talking about um, Storm, uh, we're talking about... Um, what else? What else fits that category? Um, Infect. Those decks are very, very, very consistent at doing what they do, okay? So if the chances of you winning a game where you don't just cheese them out is way way lower than against uh, some uh, some other decks that give you more time to set up and actually leverage the fact that your deck is more powerful than your opponents right i don't want to talk about bands so why i pointed out to titan when there is storm devotion <laughs> neoform yo i'm trying to help folks win the bad matchups too it's, it's not about winning the good matchups only it doesn't matter so yeah, just 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 trying to help out. Just trying to help out over here. Um, okay, so when we're talking about those matchups, uh, your mulligan is got is gonna have to be more aggressive. Okay, uh, basically you need to uh, ask yourself how how quickly can I kill my opponent? Okay, for example, against Storm or against Devoted Druid, they probably will have very little amount of interaction for you, uh, barring like some romance, maybe Path to Exile from Devoted Druid or something like that. So if you have a turn three amulet uh, Titan hand, right? Like you, you do have your amulet, you have Asusa, you have prime time on turn three in play, then you're probably going to keep that hand anyway, right? However, if you're on the draw, you might not have enough time, right? So you want to, I, I don't know if you actually want to mulligan one of those hands, but you want to try to play them a little bit more defensively. And you probably will end up keeping it because turn three, it's, it's still pretty good. But there's a consideration for trying to mulligan to something that will slow your opponent down and give you more time uh, for a setup, right? These are the cards that we're probably going to be talking about right there. So... Against those decks, your mulligan decision should also reflect your uh, likelihood, I guess, to uh, to win the game before you just die. <laughs> okay. Beating Fate, what side could be Cyber Solemnity? Yeah, you would play Melira. Personally, I, I don't really like Melira as a Cyber Cat period, so before playing Melira, I would probably play like a fourth Dismember or something like that. Um, if I wanted to specifically target Infect, I think Melaria is too narrow and it only works. It only works sometimes when you naturally draw it. Like you're never going to be able to add to, to actually pack for the Melaria, right? That's just not a thing that's going to happen. You're just not going to have enough time. That would mean that you're already surviving until turn four. And if you're surviving on the, until turn four, then it's, it's already likely that you're going to win. So. What much of my travel with is humans, so using what you said, I probably need to consider having a dismembering game too, because it's probably likely they will get melee mage on me. Yeah. 
So let me be worse against other decks too, right? Yes, but it's a one of that you need to naturally draw, and it's white. We have a grand total of three white sources in the entire deck. A full three white sources. So the chances of you being able to cast that Solemnity before you die I are very, very, very low. Yeah, Solemnity does all sorts of great things, but... I mean, just calling them great things is, is an overstatement, obviously, but... Like, the chances of you casting it early before, you know, while it matters... Are not... Yeah. <laughs> not particularly normal. What if you play Dryad? Then you have to resolve your 3-drop, and only after you have resolved your 3-drop, you can actually wait. If you survive yet one more turn, then you're going to be able to play your, your hate card. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Joking, don't answer. Sorry. Too late for that. Doesn't matter. Too late. Dryad seems better than creature's deck for sure. Yes, I mean, Valakut is just good against creature decks, right? Enough, very often. Um... Creature decks do, um, creature decks do um, play very little in the form of interaction. So yeah, that definitely works. Tell me about Sol Solemnity, I'm just on mine and explosives. Oh, nice. That's that's pretty hot. Um. Anyway, so as far as going to. If cyborging against those decks, you're going to try to alter your your cyborging uh, in in that fashion, right? And again, you're you're going to alter it even further, whether you're on the play or on the draw. Maybe on the draw, a turn three amulet, titan uh, amulet, and titan hand, it might not even be good enough because you might just die on turn three, right? Uh, granted, you get one more draw towards uh, towards a uh, way of interacting, but meh, you know. Kind of take it, take it with a grain of salt. Um, now, let's say that we're playing against, like we were saying earlier, a Thoughtseize deck. Okay, this would be John. This would be um, John the Death Shadow. Um, are there any other Thoughtseize decks? Not really, right? I guess Eldrassitron. Can be kind of a Thoughtsy stack. All right, whatever. I don't think I will consider a Dracitron when, when I'm using this generalization. But when you're looking at it, when you're if we're against a Thoughtsy stack, uh, you have to think about multiple things. Number one is what kind of interaction is your opponent going to be playing? Your opponent is going to be playing Thoughtsies. Duh. That's, that's what we're considering it. Uh, Eldrassian taxes, lol. Yeah, fair. Um, they're going to be playing Thoughties. They're going to be playing uh, some combination of Ashiok, Damping Sphere, Full Minator Mage, and um, in the case of Jond, lists have been running uh, Stone Rain, which in terms of playing around it, it's just, it's just very similar to Full Minator Mage, basically. Um, is there any other... Yeah, that's it. That, that's that's pretty much everything that, that we're going to be talking about. I yeah Inquisition, yeah when I said thoughts is of course I meant thoughts is slash Inquisition whatever. Uh, in the case of Grixis Shadow, you're also going to be have uh, to play you're also going to have to play around Disdainful Stroke and Stubborn Denial. But those are a little bit a little bit different. You know we, we have ways of playing around those thanks to Cavernous Souls and and you know siding out our Summoner's Paths in order to you know bring actual threats like Tracker um, and, and stuff like that. Shadow is so horrendous play against. It can be rough. It can be rough. If you were going to an event this weekend, I'm assuming you'd play this style list and not dry about the good list, Edgar shirt. Yeah, probably probably yes, Aaron. I, I, I definitely need more testing with the dryad list for sure. For sure. Gigs with Shadow Player, yes, there are a lot of bad shadow players though. Yeah, that's that's also true, yeah, for sure. Um Do you sandbag your amulets on turn one if you're on the draw? You mean against Shadow? If my if my if my Grixis Shadow opponent goes turn one land go, then I'm definitely playing around Star with the Nile. So I'm not playing an amulet on turn two into their stub ED. Um But if they're playing like John Shadow or something, no, I I I have to resolve the amulet, right? It, it, against those decks, you have to take different things into consideration. First of all, 
again, what, what kind of hate they're going to be playing and how your hand lines up against those kinds of hate. What I mean by this is, uh, I guess Liliana is one of the things that I didn't consider that I should be considering. Liliana of the Veil, that is. Um, so usually against those kind of decks, what I want is a hand flushed with ramp. I want ramp and lands. I don't ever want to see a Titan until like turn four or five. Yep. Um, be so something like this. If I see the seven against like Grixis Shadow or John or something like that, I am snipping this so hard. You can, even with this land sequence, you can even play around Fulminator. Speak speak about value, right? Um, so I would I would snap this hand off so quickly. Um, but that is exactly because of what I'm what I'm what I'm saying right here, which is I am trying to uh, inform my mulligan decisions by what my opponent could have and how I can play around all of those things. So um, against a discard spell kind of deck, you want to make sure that you keep a bunch of redundant ramp. Explore is going to be your best card in the matchup by a serious, a considerable amount, uh, which is funny. <laughs> how Explore actually becomes the best card in the deck. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Because um, it, it helps you progress your game plan without costing you a card, which is just absolutely huge in, the, in a matchup like this, which is all about um, about trying to stay as high as possible on resources. Um, so uh, against something like uh, Death Shadow, I am a little bit more inclined towards trying to keep a hand with interaction. And this is twofold. First of all, the Death Shadow lists usually play more counter magic than than this card spell. A second of all, the Shadow deck clocks you way way faster than the um, than the John decks. So if you are able to um, to stop their clock and buy yourself enough time to recoup the advantage, uh, your your likely your likelihood of uh, of winning that game is going to be significantly higher. So uh, that is what you what you want to take into consideration when you're playing against a deck like that. Also, th something that becomes very important, uh, as I was saying, I, I touched on a, a little bit. Uh, right then, it's on your land se sequencing, right? If you're trying to play around a uh, Fulminator Mage, you want to try to hold on your to your bounce lands in hand until you can land an Azusa and you can play like multiple lands in the turn. Because if you go turn one land, turn to Simigos Chamber, and then like your opponent goes Fulminator Mage and they leave you with no lands in play, then, uh, you know, you're just going to die. <laughs> You're just going to lose the game immediately. Same thing against a uh, Damping Sphere. If you expect your opponent to have Damping Sphere, you want to try to delay how early you play your Simic Growth Chamber for basically as long as you as you possibly can. Uh, because uh, Simic Growth Chamber and like any one of the other Bounce Lands actually do have the downside in this case. Uh, sometimes bouncing, being, uh, forcing you to find a land, uh, to bounce a land is, is upside, right? When when you're trying to transmit to Loyal West, when you have an amulet in play, bouncing a land is actually upside. Uh, but when you're facing Fulminator Mage and Damping Sphere and that kind of stuff, and you don't have an amulet, then uh, the bounce trigger is actually very, very uh, counterproductive for us. So... So yeah, so you want to try to sequence your lands in such a way. For example, if I, if I knew that we're playing against Jund or something, I would go turn one T-West, turn two field, turn three Cavern of Souls on human, right? And then, you know, turn three, play Azusa and play both bounce lands and bounce, I guess, Cavern and T-West. Yep. My opponent does have a Fulminator. They destroy one of my Sim Growth Chambers. I still have access to, uh, to four mana, right? But if they... But if they destroy my land on turn two, I, I just lose the game on the spot, basically. Cool, like, how's it going? Um, so, yeah. That's in terms of um, discard spell decks. Against something like um, control decks, for example. One thing that I have seen people do, which I think it's very smart, because uh, I, I guess that people have been, have been, I don't know, if reading my... <laughs> 
<laughs> reading my my uh, cyber guide or whatever. But I have I have seen people. In fact, the other way I was I was messing around playing some blue white control, and I played the mentor on turn three, and my opponent immediately dismembered it, and I'm like, good job, opponent. You don't want to sideboard against the deck the same way that you would sideboard for the main deck configuration. You have to sideboard for your opponent's sideboard configuration, if that makes sense. So if your opponent is going to be bringing, be bringing in Monastery Mentors against you, you want to be ready. You want to have this member. Your opponent is also probably going to have Mendelion clicks. So, you know, you will. whenever I, I sideboard against blue white control, I actually... I actively want to bring in these members because I'm thinking about what my opponent's thinking and my opponent wants to clock me because they need to clock me, right? If we go to the very, very long game, chances are that I'm going to be able to win. But I am sideboarding for their sideboard plan. And I'm going to try to, to make sure to take advantage of that. Even before we see the actual card. Yeah, so let's say that, your opponent, that you lose game one, right? Let's say that you lose game one. And now you don't have these members, and then your opponent goes turn two mentor, turn three mentor. You you just basically just lost the game on the spot, right? So yeah. I'm not saying bring in all these members, this member is incredible against blue white control. I am saying you want to have access to one or two of these members, or in this case, you know, Beast Within is actually a very a very nice answer because it's it's very flexible. Right, it's the same reason why you know I used to take I used to take out Radiant Fountain against Blue White, and then it happened over and over again that I would just like my opponent would play a click at the end of my turn three, and then they would just counter all of my stuff, and then the click would just clock me, and I would just die to Vendillion click beats, like six turns later, and I'm like, why, you know. I didn't. That didn't have to happen, right? Instead of siding in Radiant Fountain, I started siding out Sun Home Fortress of the Legion because this hand, this card is way, way less valuable in the matchup than Radiant Fountain is, considering my opponent's sideboard configuration. My opponent, if they, my opponent knows if they're if they are a savvy blue white player, they know that it's not that likely for them to win the late game. So they're going to sideboard in such a way that helps this helps them uh, finish the game uh, as soon as possible. And Radiant Fountain is, is is a way to think of that plan and make your deck the best possible against the plan that your opponent has against you. Yeah. All right. Can I validly run Fry in place of Beast Within? Yes, you will need to make some, some mana base changes. The, in the current configuration, we have access to... Ooh, gemstone Mine. Where's Gemstone? There. With the current configuration, we only have access to three uh, red sources. So, for example, your Bounce Lands, your other color Bounce Lands, so like this should probably be Gruel Turf. We're going up to five. Uh, you probably want to have access maybe to one or two more gemstones, maybe over one castle and one basic forest or something like that. Yeah, so that's that's what I would that's what I would say. But yeah, I think that Biz Within is is the best card that we have access to in our colors. Honestly, Biz Within has been very 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 good for me. Being able to destroy Tron's lands has been pretty huge, actually. Where did the second forest come from? Only running two green pools. Only two pools and uh, no fetches. Yep. Does that make sense? Any further questions, chat, before we wrap this up? I'm gonna give it like one or two minutes for for you folks to to shoot me some questions, and if we are if we are done with questions, I'm gonna just take a quick little break and then I will be back. I'm gonna play through one league. So if you have your questions, speak up right now. In what matchups do I side out Field of the Dead? 
Uh, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? Like, there's so much as where Field of the Dead just doesn't matter. If you're playing against Neobrand, if you're playing against Storm, uh, Devoted Druid decks, like, against decks that don't really have a mid-range plan against you, then Field of the Dead is just an ETB tap plan that doesn't do anything. So you can either just straight up side them out, or if you're bringing... You, if you want to keep, still keep your, your land count high, you can side this out and you can bring in Cavern of Souls for Tickets. How many counter spells should I run in Cyber? Ugh, that is... That is entirely up to you, my friend. I don't know what meta you're, you're playing against. Counter spells are, are good against... A, a spell-based combo, uh, to a lesser extent, control, and mostly spell-based spell, spell -based combo and uh, Tron. That's like the only places where I would like to see counter spells right now. Explorer with Dryad seems weird. What are your reasons? Uh, the fact that I don't want to play Valakuts in my deck. How do you like Edgar's list? I actually have not seen it. Did, did he post it on Twitter? Um, let's see. I don't see it in his Twitter page. Why are you talking about this? This list? I actually play this list on stream. If that is the one that you're talking about. And I think it's cool. I think it, it, it does what it wants to do, which is good. Yeah, well, we actually stream that list here. It's by far the, the list that I like the best out of all the... Out of all the Dryad lists, it is by far the, the, the list that I like the best, for sure. Went for about a month and was able to catch... Oh, so yeah, cool. Like, no, no problem. That, I mean, I ask for people to ask me questions, so you are... <laughs> you, you don't need to apologize at all. Disagree, you make your deck strictly worse. Um... No, you're not making it strictly worse. What I'm saying is, if it doesn't, I mean, if you don't put the combo together, yes, you're making your deck strictly worse, right? That's my point. Both cards don't do anything without the other one. Dryad is a worse Asusa, and Valakut is just an ETV tap land that taps for a color that we don't care about. So yes, both cards by themselves are strictly worse than here. Here, every land that we are playing is a land that we want to have in our deck, and it's good in and of itself. So I think that, hi kid, you like violence here, you're, you're not understanding what it is that, that I'm saying. You're basically adding a combo to your deck. You're adding an extra uh, an extra avenue that is going to be better against some decks, uh, but it's going to be worse against some other decks. And you you actually will end up setting out the whole like Valakut Dryad thing in in a fair amount of uh, cyborg matchups. I mean, I actually streamed the deck like the entire week, so <laughs> so you can go check the vods. <laughs> I've been trying the deck out a fair amount. It's not like I have not been playing it. I've been mean, making some changes and stuff. Even last week, right? I, I started streaming it last week, I think. What all are you streaming today? I don't know what what that question means, Mac Machiavelli. Yeah, I I, w I was replying to a reply. Uh, hi, kid. Oh, they're asking what list I'm streaming this. The, the one that you see right right now on, on, on here. All right. I'm going to take a quick break, uh, go to the bathroom, all that good stuff. And then I will be back and I will play a league with this list. Uh, I will be looking for changes. I'm, I'm still not sure about this negate over here. So this probably should be uh, another beast within. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with it for now. But yes, I will be back and I will be playing at least one league with this list. Okay. So don't go anywhere. 
and uh, post your questions and I can, answer, I can answer them afterwards. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed uh, the video. Hope you like uh, this kind of, uh, you know, in-depth content, I guess. And don't forget to like, subscribe and all that good stuff. And I will see you in the video uh, that's going to go right next to this one. You're going to be able to find it in the description down below. Uh, have a good one and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.